I would to have a word of prayer again. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us all here again safely. I just pray that you will speak through me to your people and um, that, again, we will walk away learning something more and actually uh, feeling the need to be closer to you and to be prepared for these end times, Father. Thank you so much for hearing and answering our prayers in Jesus' name. Okay, and so before we get started, I'm going to ask our, uh, our gentlemen, our deacons at the front, uh, pretty much what everyone is going to receive is a packet that is like this, okay? And within the packet, we have a list of important web links and information for further review. That we're going to have like an initial um, sermonette uh, presentation today, but it's not the universe of all there is on religious liberty, but at least that gives you a start with the handout that's in there. There's also another handout on a recommended uh, history books that I think everyone should uh, take a look at. A number of these books are in the public domain and PDF format, and there are others that you can find on uh, Amazon. Um, one of the things that my church in Morristown, what we do in terms of religious liberty, you know, in the past we used to do presentations just once a year, but with things happening so quickly, we decided that it's important to give an update uh, maybe three to four times per year, so once every quarter. And what we try to do is also to give everyone a packet like what you're receiving, where we update the web links, I update the history books, and I also uh, provide magazines from Liberty. In fact, I um, have to thank Pacific Press and the North American Division, uh, Liberty Magazine, for these magazines. I've been working with them for a number of years, and so, uh, I do thank them for all the magazines that they have uh, given to us. They ship them here to Carolina so that we can pass them out. And then also when I'm up in New York, these are the magazines we give. Also, uh, Voice of the Martyrs. One of the reasons I included that magazine in there is because this is an organization that talks about Christian persecution around the world. And I think it's important that we understand what our Christian brethren are going through and to always just to keep them in prayer. Um, one of the things that the North American Division of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department is doing, they have building community and advocating for freedom. So I believe that most of you should have this. I asked for as many copies as I could, and I put what I could into these um, packets. So building community and advocating for freedom. And here we have different tabs on public affairs, religious freedom, Liberty Magazine, and one of their most recent um, projects is Faith and Politics. They have a YouTube channel that is uh, run by Orlin or moderated by Orlin Johnson. He's the Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty uh, for the North American Division. And I've seen this program and you know what's good is, is that they have several segments on legislative activities, courts and cases, politics at work, and they're talking to lawyers, uh, judges, other teachers, sometimes they're talking to um, those in the entertainment world, but it's good in that they're kind of discussing faith and politics as the uh, title of the program has it. So if you take some time to actually go into their YouTube channel for Faith and Politics and take a look at some of the programs that they have presented, I think that it would be a blessing and very informative to you. Uh, but, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that at least um, each family here in the church uh, received a copy of this. Outside of that, there were a couple of uh, little cards that the North American Division gave to me where you can scan the QR code and it'll take you to their page and the different things that they have um, available. The other thing that I wanted to put in here are uh, some books from 3ABN, and I've read both of these. And the reason I put these in here is because these are two of the major issues that we're dealing with in this country right now. Um, the first being, can the Christian church affirm LGBTQ? And this is all Bible-based. And I, I've gone through this book, I've read it from front to back, I think it's very important, and I think what's interesting is, is that they now have a campaign where they wanna try to put this book in all of the Christian churches in the country. So 
keep 3ABN in prayer on that because I think that this is very informative uh, for individuals. But one of their other books is called The Truth About the Lord's Day. And in light of what's happening now, especially more chatter about the Sabbath, though the Sabbath you're hearing about in society is not Saturday, not Shabbat, it is Sunday. And a lot of people really need to be educated on what the true Sabbath is, what true rest is. And so this is another book that they have, and honestly, I think that they need to put this in all the Christian churches too. But I wanted uh, each person to have this in their packet so that you can understand that these are the issues, the issues for the more liberal community and issues for the more conservative community. This is what we're dealing with. But I think that if you have a good basis and understanding of where the Bible stands on these issues, you can be a great witness to the people you face. Okay. Um, continuing on, I would I thought that I would start with a poem. And this this poem is called Free Grace and Free Will. I actually got this poem out of American State Papers. This is American State Papers bearing on Sunday legislation. This is the 1911 edition. Uh, published by the Religious Liberty Association. It's about 800 pages. This is just an abbreviated printout that I have, but there's a link uh, in your materials, and also I've uh, provided the PDFs to uh, Sister Carol and to the pastor so that uh, if any, any individual wants to be able to pull this and uh, have it developed, they can. It's, it's interesting because it goes into the history of some of the Sunday laws for each of the states. And so this particular poem was actually found in this book, American State Papers, and I wanted to start off by reading that. And it says, freedom and reason make brave men. Take these away, what are they then? Mere groveling brutes and just as well, the beasts may think of heaven or hell. Tis man's free will, if he believe, tis God's free, w free will him to receive. To stubborn willers this I'll tell, tis all free grace and all free will. Know then that every soul is free to choose his life and what he'll be. For this eternal truth is given, that God will force no man to heaven. He'll call, persuade, direct him right, bless him with wisdom, love, and light, in nameless ways, be good and kind, but never force the human mind. And I think that is really important because this is something that you're seeing really on both sides of the political realm with two aspects of force. And God is not a God of force. So in my talk today, what I'm going to do is I want to try to blend in like a sermonette and some updates on uh, religious freedom. And um, uh, Sister Carol, I'll let you know when we can put up the, uh, the first uh, legislative uh, bill. So I thought I'd ask a few thought questions for you to ponder, especially during the time that we're living in right now. And, and the first one is, why do we go ahead of God? What is it about humanity that says, you know, Lord, I know that you're coming soon. I know the prophecy will be fulfilled. I know that you tell us many times in the Bible to wait on you, like in Psalms 27, 14, when you say, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord, but Lord, you're not moving fast enough. Look at what's happening. Maybe I need to assist you. Why do we feel like God's timing on various matters in our lives is off? Why do we feel at times that we don't really have to follow the word of God, that following all of the Bible is optional? We say that we believe in prophecy, but why doesn't prophecy matter enough? Are we facing some of society's issues right now because we have not been praying enough, reading the Bible enough, choosing to assist the Lord? And so I thought I would start on a definition of what is religious freedom? So according to the Religious Freedom Institute, religion is first and foremost the human search for a greater than human source of being and ultimate meaning. Religion is the effort of individuals and communities to understand, to express, and to seek harmony with the transcendent reality of such importance that they feel compelled to organize their lives around their understanding of it. Religious freedom is a fundamental right that is guaranteed in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. 
It is the equal right of all human beings and all religious communities to the free exercise of religion. Religious liberty includes the right to believe or not to believe in religious truth. There is no hint of coercion in the American understanding of religious freedom, meaning that one must believe. Religious liberty is a lifestyle, and this is something that we say many times, especially uh, in my church in Morristown and the churches in New York, and that is, it is a lifestyle. Religious liberty, is, it's something that is a part of you. It is what is in your bloodstream. Freedom is for everyone. Every person on the planet wants religious liberty. And lately, that has, that has not been the sentiment that individuals are witnessing in Christian circles. You've got Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Taoists, Scientologists, Christian scientists, they all want freedom. Now, certainly at my church in Morristown, New Jersey, if we're going to address religious liberty matters, we address all of it. We discuss all of it. Whatever is touching on the liberal side, moderate side, conservative side, at the end of the day, the choice is for you to make, not for us to force or to take. So the application today is, when you think about your life, think about these questions. When you get up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? What do you do for a living? Why are you at church this afternoon versus home or at work? What company do you keep on a regular basis? What do you do for fun and relaxation? How do you take care of your health? Why do you spread the gospel? And I remember listening to a pastor say that with every decision that you make, you're choosing which side you're on. You're choosing who has authority over your life. Now, notice some of the questions that I had posed uh, to you just now. These are the types of issues that we're facing in the courts, and especially with some of the cases that I'm handling, the, some of the federal cases. Issues like where to educate your children. Uh, a number of my colleagues around the country are dealing with this with some of their clients. Where to educate your children, how to raise your children, days to work or be off during work, mandatory medical treatments, whether to take them or not, pastors and evangel evangelists preaching and are witnessing in public areas and getting arrested. Now, I mean, you generally hear a lot of that happening overseas, but it's starting to happen here in the United States. I mean, I've had uh, colleagues in Florida and California dealing with these types of issues. I mean, it hasn't hit our PJI yet in New York, and I'm sure that eventually is coming, but honestly, I'd like to be ready for that. I, I, I really enjoy criminal defense, and I really believe that people deserve a second chance. I also believe that one day we will be considered criminal because of the way that we uh, believe, the way when, when we choose to worship, and so I'm just trying to prepare for that. And, you know, it's only a matter of time, I think, before that happens, especially in New York, but it's the fact that it is happening here in the United States, and we're just trying to be prepared for that. Your faith says who you are and whose you are. It's in your bloodstream. So if a person says that they rely 100% on the Bible, nothing should sway them. Notice that I am saying faith is personal to the individual. Faith cannot be forced. When identifying whether a burden is imposed on the exercise of religious beliefs, courts must not question the sincerity or judge the significance of a particular belief. And that comes from a court case of Carter v. Fleming uh, from the Fourth Circuit in 2018. Your faith, who you place your allegiance in, who has ultimate authority over your life, is a choice. We look at texts like Joshua 24, 15 that says, and if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom you will serve. And Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20, that says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. Now, an application, and I know Sister Carol uh, will be bringing this up, there's legislation in New York that could impact children uh, and gender selection. So one particular assembly bill is AO 1283, an Equal Rights Amendment, and this bill passed the Senate and was sent to the New York Secretary of State. And the way this bill is written, it would allow children to make decisions about their health. 
All right, and so what we're doing is we're talking about recent case law and legislation that you need to pay attention to. Um, the next bill is in page three of the uh, materials that I gave you, of the bigger packet, 10-page materials. Uh, this is California's bill AB 1955. This bill actually was just signed uh, by Governor Gavin Newsom into law where it's banning schools from notifying parents of a child's gender identity. The school officials do not have to tell parents about their children wanting to identify as another gender. And the idea is to protect the LGBTQ youth, and, but yet it keeps parents in the dark. Um, one of the things I'll point out about this is, is that uh, we had a parent several months ago in New York that contacted us uh, from the boroughs, and you know she was saying that her child had been going to after-school programs that, were, that was geared for LGBTQ youth. The parents were not told about it. And then when the child is 17 years old, telling their mother, you know what, I have decided I want to adopt the alternative lifestyle. And you know, the mother is a Christian, the father is a Christian, they took their kids to church and now the child is saying, no, I don't wanna to go to church. I want you to buy me a women's clothing. And she calls us up wondering to know what to do. The problem is, is that the child is 17. And because the school has already started indoctrinating these kids from the time that they entered high school, it's practically too late and they're practically grown. And so at that point, we started talking about the possibility of emancipation, especially because the mother also had a 10-year-old in the house and was concerned about the influence on the 10-year-old. But you're starting to see this in education. You're starting to see uh, a lot of public schools that are adopting this because they want to embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion, and this is one of the ways that they're doing it. But I, so this is one of the bills I want you to pay attention to in California, AB 1955. Uh, there is a report that came out also. This is on pages one to two of your packet. It's the CAS report. And Dr. Hillary Cass recently published a nearly 400 page report on gender identity services for children and young people. The report which was commissioned by the National Health Service in England uh, over roughly four years ago found remarkably weak evidence to support the use of puberty blockers and hormone treatments for gender, sorry, gender distressed children. The report also includes 32 specific, rec specific recommendations on how gender services should operate in England. And, but really in their report, it was also talking about the fact that there are links to mental health issues um, with this matter. And I just think it's interesting that you're starting to see more society. They're not looking at the medical aspect. They're looking at the fact that, well, you know what? This is a new day. We've evolved in our thinking. You know, our, I, I want to give my young people more freedoms and I want to feel, I, I don't want them to feel threatened. I don't want them to feel depressed and be suicidal. And, and I'm not dismissing those, um, those sentiments. I mean, suicide is very uh, real in, young, in youth that are in this, uh, in this area, but at the same time, that's why we have to believe in prayer. That's why we have to turn to the Lord and seek his guidance on this because you know we know that we live in a sinful world we know that the devil is trying to attack the family and so this is one of the ways that he's doing that so i think it's good at least for our churches to be aware of reports like this to be aware of bills that have been signed like this so that we know that you know what we need to be busy praying asking God, witnessing, being a witness to others and letting them know there, there is a better way, that God's way actually works. Um, then I wanna continue on. Private parents fighting against public schools regarding parental rights and ability to raise their children according to their religious beliefs. Uh, so Sister Carol, if you can have the second website uh, ready to go. So one of the complaints that I have a link in your materials is the Dan Mavy Rockford Public School District. And this is in the district, uh, Western District of Michigan. So this is a case where a young, a young person is experiencing some mental health issues. And she was missing assignments and having to go to the guidance counselor often. The school started making decisions about the girl's education. And instead of treating the young child as a girl, the school started treating the child as a boy. 
addressing the child with male names, all without notifying the parents. And you see, that's what I'm saying. These are some of the things that you're starting to see in society. The concern right now is the removal of parental rights and how parents raise their own children under the First Amendment right to exercise faith in upbringing of their children. Uh, I do have a link to this, that's on page four of the materials. Definitely take a look at that case. This case here, this is from the Beckett uh, Law Group. Beckett is another religious liberty organization. Uh, I know that they have handled cases for uh, Seventh-day Adventists in the past, especially as it related to uh, Sabbath accommodations. But this case is the Mahmoud v. McKnight case. And it was basically a complaint against the Maryland County Board of Education and whether parents have the right to opt their children out of reading LGBTQ themed books or participation in curriculum violating their rights to raise their children in accordance to their faith and how their faith defines identity and sexuality. So this case is involving Muslim and Jewish parents who are stating that the materials are not age appropriate for young children. The board wanted to include these books to foster diversity and inclusivity for the LGBTQ community. So one of the books being Pride Puppy, Uncle Bobby's Wedding, Born Ready, The True Story of a Boy Named Penelope, being integrated into the K through five curriculum. So you've got Muslim and Jewish uh, parents that are concerned about this. In the opinion from the fourth circuit that came out, the school board provided books and materials to the teachers for answering questions that the students may have. And at the school, some of the guidance given uh, counselors that if a student says that a girl can only like boys because she's a girl, the teacher can disrupt or either disrupt either the thinking by saying something like, oh, well, actually people of any gender can like whoever they like. How do you think it would make, insert a name, how do you think it would make this person hear you say that? Do you think it's fair for people to decide for us who we can and can't like? The court stated that simply hearing about other views does not necessarily exert pressure to believe or act differently than one's religious faith requires. The court felt like the evidentiary record was bare and that the parents had not shown how their free exercise rights were being violated. There was not enough evidence to show how the books were being used, what the children were being taught, or what conversations ensued. And so again, these are parents that are wanting to opt their children out of this curriculum, and the court is uh, not agreeing with them. And so in these examples here, we're seeing various individuals from various faiths fighting for their rights, fighting for faith. And when we think about the Bible and some of the things that God's prophets went through, there were times when they felt alone. For example, if you think about Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 19, he was not a popular man. Drought came to the area, and though King Ahab wanted to blame Elijah for the problems, the real culprits were King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. There was a time when Jezebel's false prophets were destroyed and she was determined to hunt Elijah down. He ran for his life. And you can read that in 1 Kings 19, 1 to 9, 14, and verse 18. Elijah felt alone, but the Lord reminded him that he was with him. Elijah didn't go ahead of God. So pay, pay attention to that because I'm going to get to a point with these uh, examples. The second example we have is Daniel in Daniel chapter 6, where he faced opposition after the Lord brought Daniel into favor with those in leadership of the kingdom of Babylon. Daniel 6.3 says that Daniel was preferred above all the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. Then in verse 4, you have the president and princes trying to find fault against Daniel, but they couldn't find any. And once King Darius signed a decree that no one could pray or petition any god but the king for 30 days, Daniel found out about this, and what was his response? In verse 10 of Daniel chapter 6, it says that Daniel got on his knees and prayed and thanked the Lord. There will always be some individuals out there that do not like you. We live in a sinful world. Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, but he was not touched. Daniel also did not go ahead of God. Third, we also think about Noah in Genesis 6, and the fact that he preached and warned people for 120 years about an event that would impact the world, but he was waved off. 
until the first raindrop fell. Noah did not go ahead of God. Despite the wickedness in the world and the preaching for many years, he did not get up tight or take measures into his own hands. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic a couple years ago, I remember hearing a pastor preach a sermon about the signs of the times involving COVID and other things. And he made this illustration on the lines uh, regarding Noah. He's like, God already said it was going to rain and the earth would be destroyed. So that's already a prophecy. God already said this would happen. That prophecy, which cannot be stopped, and Noah is preaching for 120 years. For people who discounted the prophecy back then, it's as if a group of antediluvians got together and said, now let's see what we can do to prevent the rain from falling. When a pastor said this, it was hilarious and yet profound at the same time. Fourth, we consider Esther and Mordecai in Esther's chapters three to four. Haman was determined to destroy the Jews in part because Mordecai did not bow down to Haman. What was Mordecai's response? Esther chapter four, one to three, he rent his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes and cried. When Esther was given a copy of the decree, she was grieved, but then asked for a three day fast. And you can see Esther chapters uh, four, verse four and 15 to 17. Now notice these four examples. These four men and women, they all faced opposition. It was enough for Daniel, Elijah, Esther, and Noah to pray, commune with the Lord, fast and witness with their lives despite being, things happening to them and society at large. And the question I asked, and honestly, this is a question that I asked when we did our presentation in Morristown a few uh, weeks ago. The question was, why is praying, fasting, talking with the Lord, Bible study, witnessing with your life, not good enough. When you see things happening in society that are in line with prophecy. So in other words, we already know these things are going to happen, especially as Adventists, if you're studying prophecy, studying Daniel and the Revelation, you know that these things are going to happen. But I believe that all four of these, uh, these individuals, they realized Ephesians 6.12 that says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. They all understood our sermonic text for today. Second Chronicles 20, 15 to 17 and Exodus 14, 13 and 14. They understood that they could not be afraid since the battle belonged to the Lord and the Lord would fight for them. Adventists now are getting mocked on social media by people who don't fully understand prophecy. And many Christians don't really want to understand prophecy or study history. And the thing is, is, is that I don't know if you've been on YouTube lately, but I wanna say it seems like every week or every other week, there is someone that is looking down on Adventists or making a negative comment about Adventism. And I'm like, you know, it's putting us more in the forefront. And a question that you should ask yourself is, am I ready to witness, to stand up for our faith and to not be ashamed and not be afraid to say, yes, I believe in this whole Bible. I believe in the Bible front to back. That's really important. So many don't understand that what we are seeing in society are some of the things that prophecy says will occur. So what happens as a result? Uh, Sister Carol, if we can put up the next one. Because so many people don't understand what's happening in prophecy, what we're seeing is Oklahoma schools requiring that the Bible be taught in a classroom or that teachers would lose their license. The idea of teaching the Bible as a historical book is to infuse Christian values in public schools. This is also helping to shape the next generation. Every teacher will have a Bible in the classroom. The Ten Commandments will also be included. This is one particular notice uh, by the superintendent of the public uh, instruction, Ryan Walters, and he said the following, any teacher that would knowingly, willfully disobey the law and disobey our standards, there are repercussions for that. So we deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis, but yes, teachers have to teach Oklahoma academic standards, and this is absolutely gonna be part of them. So if a teacher refuses to follow the Bible instruction mandate, they'd face the same consequences as one who refuses to teach about the Civil War. 
The punishment would include revocation of their teaching license. Uh, this is what the superintendent said, a, a process that requires a vote by the Oklahoma State Board of Education. And the source for this is in the materials that I gave to you. My concern is, I, I, I understand, I think it's important to teach children the proper way to live, but I know that education starts in the home first, not with the government. If a student goes up to the teacher and says that they have questions about the fourth commandment and they want more, you want to know more about the Sabbath, and that teacher decides to educate the student or even the whole class on the truth of the Bible, all it would take would be a few phone calls from concerned parents about indoctrinating their children away from what those parents taught them. So if you have a parent that comes in that says, my child has been in Sunday school since age five, and now they're hearing something different about the Sabbath. Now, one of the things you're hearing, um, especially in Adventist circles and others, is that, well, you know, this is an opportunity to tell them the truth. And I, I understand that. I, I mean, I, I think that's great. And if they're receptive, fine. But I think because there's a different agenda that's involved here, that some are not going to be receptive. Kind of like what we're seeing on the West Coast in terms of the teachers that don't want to educate children on the LGBTQ uh, gender identity. These are teachers, Christian teachers, that are saying, no, I, if I'm going to teach a child, and you're seeing this actually also in New Jersey too, I'm going to teach a child that there are two genders. You came into this world through a man and a woman. There are not 400 genders. Some of those teachers are being disciplined right now. And I feel like the same thing would happen in this situation, that you get a parent that starts complaining and saying, look, my child goes to Sunday school. Why are you teaching them about Shabbat? Why are you teaching them that in over 100 languages around the world, Saturday is Shabbat, Saturday is Sabbath. Why are you telling them that? I don't want my child to hear that. Some teachers would be bold enough and say, yeah, you know what? I'm allowed to teach the Bible. I'm going to teach it front to back. So this is what I choose to do. I don't want those teachers to be in trouble. But also another issue is the fact that you have Jew those in the Jewish community and the Muslim community, and the links to that is also in your material. Those in the Jewish and Muslim communities, they're also standing up against this and stating to the superintendent, look, you have no business doing this. I want my child to understand the Quran. I want my child to understand the Torah and not the Bible. Remember what I've been saying, religious liberty is for everyone. Everyone wants it. Everyone wants it. And when I think about the fact that God, since the Garden of Eden, gave man a choice, you know, that no, God is not a God of force. Our job as Adventists are it, to be witnesses, to show people that, you know, God's way is better, that his way is understanding this Bible from front to back. But all you can do is be a witness. You can't force it on anyone. And honestly, I feel in, in some circles, that's, that message is being lost. Our next, our next bill is the Louisiana bill, HB 71. This is on page three of the uh, materials, the link to this. This is requiring the Ten Commandments to be in all the public schools. And one of the things you'll notice, I, I don't know, Sister Carol, if you can scroll down a little bit uh, on this bill, is, is that the version of the Ten Commandments that's listed do not include the entire text of the Ten Commandments. It might be a little bit further, further down, where it just lists just the one-liners of the Ten Commandments. There it is, right there. Okay. So when you're looking at that, that's not even the entire Ten Commandments. This is just the first lines of it. And so what happens is it's easy for a person to put their own spin on this. And some of the questions that have been posed have been, well, which version of the Ten Commandments are, will be used? There's so many out there. You know, what do you tell the students that start asking about the Sabbath and the Fourth Commandment? What about students that don't believe in the Ten Commandments? Why not display items from other faiths in the school as well? And one of the cases that uh, has been talked about in the media is a case of Stone v. Graham uh, from 1980. This is 449 U.S. 39. And so this was a case, and I actually put the link to this in the materials on page four. The issue here was posting the Ten Commandments in the walls of the classroom in the state of Kentucky. Copies were purchased with private con contributions, and at the bottom of each copy of the Ten Commandments was the language, the secular application of the Ten Commandments is clearly seen in its adoption as the fundamental legal code of Western civilization and the common law of the United States. 
the court concluded that though several of the commandments were secular in nature, the first four of the commandments concerns the religious duties of believers. The display could give students the impression that the state was promoting religious beliefs of the commandments. That was the commentary in Stone v. Graham. Now the question is, since there are some suits that have been filed about this, whether or not we're gonna see this particular case, Stone v. Graham, overturned. Uh, anyways, this is something to keep in mind, be aware of. Again, these links are in your materials so that you can take some time and really uh, understand. And also, too, there are several other states like Texas, Alabama, Tennessee, that are also considering similar measures. And so page three of the materials gives you links to that so that you can um, really take a look at. Now, another thing that we have done, and we started actually doing this in, um, in a Morristown, is to talk a little bit about history. The fact that I have friends of mine that are non-denominational, that are Christians and don't really go to church, when I ask them about, well, why don't you study history? Why don't you go back and, in addition to studying the Bible, understand you know, what happened in this country? No, you know what, we don't, we don't need to understand it. I mean, they literally wave me off. We don't need to understand it. We just need to love the Lord, that's it. So the idea of studying history is not as important for some people. In our church, we believe that it is, and that's one of the reasons why in the materials we gave you a list of recommended books. There's a book that we're gonna talk about towards the end of this so that you can really uh, get an understanding of where we're coming from. But in history, you have people like William Penn. William Penn was the son of an English admiral. He was a writer and religious thinker. He was one of the Quakers that came to America and ultimately founded uh, Pennsylvania. In 1664, Parliament outlawed all religious meetings but those sanctioned by the Church of England. Roman Catholics and other dissenters suffered from the vengeance of this and other similar rigid re uh, regulations. Quakers went to jail by the thousands and many died in prison. And in 1670, on Grace Church Street in London, Penn was preaching to believers in the street and he was arrested he, for disturbing the peace. He went to court. In court, there was an exchange between Penn and the criminal judge, and this was in the city of London. And so Penn wanted to know what was his indictment based on. The judge said, oh, you know, the common law, which means body of law based on court decisions or a judge's decisions rather than statutes. English common law emerged in England and was created during the Middle Ages. But really, the judge said that, but really could not give a clear answer to Penn on what his indictment was. So there was a grand jury uh, that was called. They returned a not guilty verdict. The jury was threatened with fines and possible torture if they, did, if they did not return a verdict to the judge's satisfaction, but they would not yield. The jury was sent out multiple times, returned with the same verdict. What happened? Each juror fined and imprisoned until the fine was paid. And I put a link into the materials with that. Uh, one of the reasons that I talked about this is because there's this book, and I don't know if you all have seen this, but this book here, Dateline Sunday USA, I know that, um, I want to say a few months ago when I went on to iTunes, they had this in PDF format. I don't know if they still have hard copies of this book, but it was written by Warren Leroy Johns. Uh, he used to work in the General Conference, and he's an attorney, and he really goes in depth on the history of Sunday laws, uh, the history of American Christian persecution. And this was one of the stories that he tells in this book. But I also went deeper into Ameri what is it, AmericanHeritage.com, and it's called The Ordeal of William Penn. Again, take a look at that particular article, and I would recommend, highly recommend this book because there's so much material here. It will give you a healthy understanding on uh, Sunday laws and what we could be facing uh, in the future. Another person is Anne Hutchinson. Anne Hutchinson lived in Boston. She started holding religious meetings in her home. During those meetings, she showed how the scriptures revealed that the road to the good life is by faith and not mechanical works. This annoyed the local clergy. So then in November 1637, though pregnant, she was tried for heresy, saying things that went against the religious thinking at that time. Uh, and she was ultimately evicted from the colony, but she was a fighter. She declared, now if you do 
condemn me for speaking what is in my conscience I know to be truth. I must commit myself unto the Lord. And in Dateline's um, Sunday USA, he said it is through this soil of intolerance that the blue laws started to blossom. Okay, so these are just a couple things to think about. Uh, there are a couple other cases I wanted to mention, uh, one being Stockton v. State, a, a case from 1856 where a person was indicted for playing a card game on Sunday. And one of the things the court noted was is that the object of the statute in place at this time was to prohibit the desecration of the Sabbath by engaging in the vicious employment of playing cards on that day, which is set apart by divine appointment as well as by the law of the land for other and better engagements. The reason why I'm noting this is because these are some of the things you're starting to hear now when they're talking about making Sunday a day of rest. You're hearing this. Another case, Commonwealth v. White. This is 190 Massachusetts, 578, a case from 1906. This is a defendant. He was farming his crop on Sunday and he was charged and convicted of violating a statute which prohibited work, except those of necessity on Sunday. So this is a statement that the court made, and I want you to pay attention to this, where the court is saying, our Puritan ancestors intended that the day should not be merely a day of rest from labor, but also the day devoted to public and private worship, to religious meditation and repose, undisturbed by secular cares or amusements. They saw fit to enforce the observance of the day by penal legislation and the statute regulations with they, which they devised for that purpose have continued in force without any substantial modifications to the present time. Whatever inconveniences might result at the present day from the literal and general enforcement of the Lord's Day Act, whatever hard cases may have arisen under it, it is still the law of the land to be judicially interpreted and administered according to the true intent and meaning and upon the same rules as would govern us in interpretation of other statutes. But see, this was their, this was their thinking back then. And again, one of the reasons we bring this up is because this is some of the thinking that you're starting to see. In the materials, and eventually I'll get to this, there are a couple links that I put in to um, this, a discussion on HR 1332, the 32 hour work week, and some of the arguments that are being made for that, as well as um, on the arguments on uh, Project 2025. But I'm just saying, these are things to pay attention to, and this is why you need to understand history. These are cases from the 1800s, and actually a lot of people don't even know that these cases exist. But these are cases from the 1800s, early 1900s, to show what the thinking was back then so that you were prepared to see what the thinking is right now and you're not caught off guard. And that's the reason why at our church in Morristown, we have decided to do presentations like once a quarter to just get people up to date, up, up to date on what's happening, not only around the country, but around the world so that no one can ever say, no one told me, I didn't know this was happening. And, and that's something that we're very concerned about um, there. Another case that I put a link to is the McGowan v. Maryland case from 1961. This is where the court said that Sunday closing laws were constitutional. I, I really wanna encourage everyone to read the dissent of that case. I believe that I sent uh, Sister Carolyn, a pastor, a PDF of the entire case, but the dissent of that case is really important. There are a couple of statements that Justice Douglas, William Douglas made. And he said, those who fashioned the First Amendment decided that if and when God is to be served, his service will not be motivated by coercive measures of government. The First Amendment commands government to have no interest in theology or ritual. This is what he's saying in 1961. The issue of these cases would therefore be in better focus if we imagine that a state legislature controlled by Orthodox Jews and Seventh-day Adventists passed a law making it a crime to keep a shop open on Saturdays. Would a Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, or Presbyterian be compelled to obey the law or go to jail or pay a fine? Or suppose Muslims grew in political strength here and got a law through a state legislature making it a crime to keep a shop open on Fridays. Would the rest of us have to submit under the fear of criminal sanctions? 
I do not believe that because I've set aside Sunday as a holy day, I have the right to force all men to set aside that day also. Why should my faith be favored by the state over any other man's faith? This is the dissent. So the thing is, this is not the law. This was not the law. But I, I, I like the fact that this, this is what he said in the dissent. And I also got uh, obtained this through Dateline Sunday because Warren Leward Johns thought it was important to really point out the fact that we're in a faith fight, especially in terms of religious liberty, okay? The mentality you're seeing during these time periods are is this, as long as you think like me and see the world as I see it, you will be fine. That's what you're seeing right now. You're seeing that on both sides. As long as you think like me, you're okay. The moment you stop, we've got a problem. That's what you're seeing. These times are coming back, and I think it'd be good for us to just review these cases so you see what individuals went through. Um, keeping on with this, the history of religious exemptions, just a brief note on that. Uh, what I included in the packet, this is the Liberty Magazine from the May-June 2024. Uh, this is the May-June 2024 issue. And on page nine, you will see a very short history of religious exemptions in America where individuals are asking for an exemption from a policy or a mandate. I want you to hopefully go back home, pay attention to these, noticing that one of the first uh, exemptions requested took place in 1669. And one reason I brought this out is because this is what we're facing in some of our cases. Individuals who've asked for religious exemptions in various, at various areas, whether they're dealing with a medical treatment, whether they're dealing with their children um, and how their children are being educated, and, they, and whether they're dealing with their day of rest. These are the things that you're seeing now that people are fighting for. And it's getting to a point where some are having to question what is faith? What is religion? What does religion mean versus what it is not? And so that's why we have these materials. That's why magazines like Liberty Magazine are important because they're telling you what's happening in society and why these issues matter, okay? The, the next website we'll put up, I wanted to just touch briefly on international concerns with Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, the reason I brought this up is because I actually spoke with a Jehovah's Witness a couple weeks ago about this, and we were talking about just other, like, insurance and attorney issues, but she was telling me about things that are happening with her particular faith, um, how people are being arrested and thrown into prison because they are Jehovah's Witnesses. As you scroll down, uh, there is a link that will take you to uh, what Jehovah's Witnesses are facing in various countries, including uh, Russia. So for example, in Russia, many individuals have been experiencing harsh judgments. For example, in January of this year, one lady was sentenced to two years forced labor in a correctional facility and required to live in a correctional facility. On March uh, 5th, 2024, nine men, the oldest of whom was 72, they were sentenced to various prison terms for up to seven years. Their convictions were the culmination of criminal cases that began in 2021, following home searches by law enforcement. So in some countries, you've got law enforcement individuals that are not allowing people to just worship you know, together in their home. They are being arrested. And when I think about the correctional facilities, I, I have been to about six prisons and two jails in the New York, New Jersey area, metro area, and then also further upstate New York, I meant, as I was telling um, the uh, congregation in uh, Morristown, that every time I go to a prison, I, I, I get annoyed because of every, all, all the things I have to go through just to see my client. I don't like the fact that they're in those conditions, that they are behind bars. I know it's not the Hilton. I know it's not the Hyatt. I've had people say that, you know, but it's how they are treated and you know, the fact that you have people who are being incarcerated because they want to worship according to the dictates of their consciences. These are things that, this, things that you need to pay attention to, okay? These are things that I take seriously and that all of us should take seriously and not to think that, well, because this is Russia or that's in China or this is in Pakistan, that that can never happen in the United States. It can't. 
Um, the Voice of the Martyrs magazine, uh, one of the reasons, again, that I included, there should be about three copies that each one has. Those are included for reasons like this, where you're able to see what's happening around the world. People who are wanting to study the Bible uh, amongst themselves or to go into their villages and to pass out Bibles and to witness, they are being persecuted. And this magazine gives you stories of what these individuals are facing. I have to say, I thank Voice of the Martyrs because before, with our church, uh, we were paying uh, per copy, and it was you know halfway decent price, but for this presentation and the one that we did in Morristown a couple weeks ago, when I spoke with the agent at Voice of the Martyrs and she knew that we would be giving these out, She's like, you know what, since you're distributing our magazines, we're gonna give them to you for free. She gave me 500, and that's why we have the number that we have here in these packets, as well as the ones that we were able to give out uh, in New York. So I'm just thankful for Voice of the Martyrs, also Liberty Magazine, and the fact that it's an opportunity for people to be educated on what's happening in religious liberty and in Christian persecution. Uh, the next website, and I know the time is ticking, so I will, we're practically done. But this, this here is Project 2025. I mean, one of the reasons why we bring this up is because the mandate for leadership, there's a lot that's going on with this. I'm not gonna go into all the politics. Really the main focus that I uh, am looking at, I know that it's the push to bring the country back to being a God-fearing nation. But there are aspects of this that are overbroad. I did put a couple links uh, to this on pages four to five. If you go into, um, uh, Sister Carol, page 585 to 589, that's really the section of concern for a lot of Adventists, a lot of Sabbath keepers, also possibly uh, Muslims and Jews, is the fact that even though they're dealing with the Department of Labor, dealing with employment and how often people should work, that there should be a day of rest and the preferred day of rest is Sunday, okay? And one of the things that you should also note is, is that according to the International Organization of Standardization, the, what is it, the ISO, that the ISO has officially made Sunday as the seventh day of the week. Okay, these are things that you've got to pay attention to. So now when you have one, Earth Sabbath and other um, organizations that care about climate change that are saying we need to give the Earth a rest and that preferred rest day is Sunday, we need to have car-free Sundays. And in fact, I have some of those articles uh, in your materials. And then you have Project 2025 and others saying, listen, we need to give our workers a rest. We need to have families come together and people need to be going to church more. And yeah, I understand that. But again, it's the idea of forcing people to do that. That's what you're seeing. And that's the concern. Okay. Uh, the other, uh, uh, so it's 585 to 589. This is a long document. It's, uh, it's 900 plus pages. But th this is primarily one of the main areas that we are concerned about because their focus in terms of rest is not on Saturday. Now, I know there's some sections of this document where they said, oh, well, you know, we would make some exceptions for those that, you know, keep Sabbath on another day or, you know, we know prophecy. We know what Daniel 11, we know what Revelation 12, 13, 14 have to say, and we know where prophecy is leading. And that's the reason why in religious liberty, we try to bring these issues up to you so that you are aware and you can go back and study for yourself. Um, the next website I want to bring up is HR 1332. So this is the four day work week, okay? One of the reasons why I brought this up is because there's actually a video, and I believe I put that in the materials, by Senator Chris Murphy. And when you watch this video, you see a discussion between Senator Murphy and a, un and a union president where they're talking about people being overworked and underpaid. I understand that. I know what it's like to work like the back-to-back 12-hour -back shifts. There are people who work back-to-back 16-hour -back shifts and they're tired. And so one of the things that the union uh, president was saying is like, you know, they don't have time for church or they're working 48 hours, 60 hours a week. They don't want to come to church on Sunday. We need to, we need to do something. And I, I get that. I, I, underst I understand that. I understand people need rest. But again, it's the idea of 
focusing on one particular day, and that day would be Sunday and recommending Sunday. And what happens if for everyone who does not follow along with that? That's the concern. What's going to happen to Jews and Muslims and atheists and so forth who don't fall in line with the 32-hour work week, who don't fall in line with Project 2025, who won't fall in line with some of these other proposals that are out there? What's going to happen to them? You know, because again, freedom is for everyone. Religious liberty is for everyone. And there has to be a better way. And that's why with this particular talk, I thought, well, the best way is to pray about it to get on your knees, to talk to the Lord, to be a witness, and show them that God's way is better. You know, um, I know my mom kind of gave you a brief uh, history of my story, so I don't have to really go into too much because she shared uh, quite a bit on that. But the one thing I will say is, is that I know what it's like to face problems, especially with accommodations in terms of uh, not working on Saturday, not taking exams on Saturday. I know like in law school, I faced that issue. And those of us who were Sabbatarians, we took our exams either Sunday or Monday when everybody else was out and enjoying themselves. And we, you know, but it was fine because at the end of the day, <laughs> as long as we were able to complete the exam and complete the course, that's great. But I understand what that's like. Also in work, being a lawyer, uh, missing out on job opportunities because I would not work on Saturday. And I have to look at it as, you know, the Lord is sparing me from something, you know. And there are jobs that God only knows what would have happened if I did decide to go in on Saturday, but I chose not to, and it was, I was blessed anyway. And even in law school, the law school, especially when it's full time, they recommend that you not have a job on the side. They want you to study full time, basically. So for me to not study Friday evening to Saturday evening, I had classmates of mine like, I don't understand. How can you, how can you skip a day when you've got 300 pages you got to read by Monday? And I'm like, that's the grace of God, because I, I was not. I was actually involved in the church out there in California, uh, Capital City. I have to say, was uh, very good to me and. Um, being a musician out there and just not even thinking about my law school work, but just focusing on a congregation was, was great. And so, like I said, the, the Lord blesses you when you follow him, when you do what he says. Um, if you take a look at the handout on the historical books, the history books that um, I'm recommending, I think it's, under, it's really important that we understand history and what our ancestors went through. Um, because I believe that one day these books will not be available. I'm wondering, Sister Carol, if we can put up the other one. Yes. Now, I don't know, how many are aware of this particular book, History of the Sabbath by Jay and Andrews? Good, a few of you. There are many who are not aware of this book. The re I'm still reading it, so I mean, granted, I feel like I'm learning every day. But what's good about this book is that it goes into deep history on the Sabbath, it talks about books that were written back in the 16th century, in the 17th century, some books that even Ellen White cites. I want to recommend this. There's a, the website is, I think it's Ellen White Audio, where you can download the PDF of this book. It's like a little over 300 pages, but I encourage you to read Jane Andrews' History of the Sabbath because that gives you a good understanding of what individuals in the 16th century, 17th century, and before it went through, okay? That's, that's one of the books. A couple other books that I want to recommend before I get to one of the main ones. This book here, and this is also on the list, The Final Authority, A Christian Guide to the King James Bible. Uh, one of the reasons we're facing some of the issues we're facing or Christians are is because they're not reading the Bible front to back. They are picking and choosing parts of the Bible that they want to study. This book here tells you how, over time, they have altered the King James Bible, how they have changed some of the words, took out words, added words. It's good to understand the history of this. And so that's one of the books that I have uh, put on the list for recommendation. Another book that helps you understand about um, church and state relations is Roger Williams and the creation of the American soul. A lot of times when we're talking about church state separation, the first person people talk about is Thomas Jefferson. Roger Williams was around in the 1600s and they 
wanted to kick him out. They did kick him out, okay? They did not like the fact that he believed in liberty of conscience. And a lot of times you don't hear people, unless you're talking in Adventist circles, when you're talking to other denominations, they don't really talk about Roger Williams. And this is the reason why I say you've got to understand your history. Understand what individuals like Roger Williams went through and Ann Hutchinson, and now, for me, recently, William Penn, what they went through when they wanted to preach, uh, according to the dictates of their consciences. So that, that's also listed. Another book I want to recommend, I first found this out through American Di um, hmm, Amazing Discoveries, uh, the Truth Matters series. That's another one that you should take a look at. The, the gentlemen that do the podcast there are, are just amazing. This book is a secular book on Sunday, and he's talking about the history of the first day of the week from Babylonia to the Super Bowl. What's good about this book is that he, you're getting a, a secular review, but he's talking about the history of Sunday and actually cites to Jay and Andrew's book, and that's uh, which I thought was interesting. Uh, so that's why I say it's good to have this available in, in your library along with the others. Um, and then one of the books that I read, I want to say about a uh, decade ago, this is called Blue Laws by David LeBan. He goes in depth on the, he's a professor. Uh, he's probably retired now, if he's assuming he's still alive. But he wrote this book, Blue Laws, The History of Economics and the Politics of Sunday Closing Laws. This is another book I would recommend so you get an understanding of the blue laws in the various states. And of course, this book here. Now, everyone has seen The Great Controversy, but I have to say, this version of The Great Controversy by far is the best I've ever seen. This book is, it, it's, it's very picturesque, um, it's annotated. So as you're going through this, you'll see a lot of pictures, a lot of charts, a lot of explanation. Um, and I think it's good for people to take a look at this particular edition of The Great Controversy. What I try to do is when I'm able to get these books, especially through Amazing Facts, I try to give these to non-Adventists, um, individuals who are reading the Bible and some who are not. But I look at this as like a good book on the history of Christianity. Take some time to look through this book if you all have not already, but this version of The Great Controversy is one of the best I have ever seen. Uh, and as I start to conclude, you know, it's, it's clear, especially after recent events, that our country is divided. For Christians that are studying and learning prophecy, this shouldn't be a surprise. Our job is to be a witness showing the world that God's way is better, as which is what I've been saying throughout today. I believe that we're experiencing some difficulty in being a true witness to the world because we see so much immorality to the point that we feel us humans have to address it. So like, for example, when I asked that question, why it is that the Bible is not enough, I asked that in Morristown, and one person said, because we just, we, we can't just sit still. We, we, we gotta stand up, we gotta do something. And you know what, I understand that, but there's a way that you can approach people. There's a way that you can stand up and make your voice heard. But at the same time, the idea is you gotta remember that you gotta be a witness. Everyone is not gonna think the same way that we do. We know that, and we know that we're not here to be popular, generally. Advent, we're, we're not here for a popularity contest. We're here to be a witness for the Lord. Um, there is a poem that, is called, that I got from Streams in the Desert. It's called Degrees of Faith, and it's something to think about. It says, when is the time to trust? Is it when all is calm, when waves the victor's palm, and life is one glad psalm of joy and praise? Nay, but the time to trust is when the waves beat high, when the storm clouds fill the sky, and prayer is one long cry, oh, help and save. When is the time to trust? Is it when friends are true? Is it when comforts woo? And in all we say and do, we meet but praise? Nay, but the time to trust is when we stand alone, and summer birds have flown, and every prop is gone, all else but God. What is the time to trust? Is it some future day when you've tried your way and learned to trust and pray by bitter woe? Nay, but the time to trust is in this moment's need. Poor broken bruised weed, poor troubled soul makes speed to trust thy God. What is the time to trust? 
Is it when hopes beat high, when sunshine gills the sky, and joy and ecstasy fill all the heart? Nay, but the time to trust is when our joy is fled, when sorrows bow the head, and all is cold and dead, all else but God. Why is it hard to let the Lord handle it? Humanity is trying to fight the devil without God's help. On July 16th, I was listening to a pastor give a talk online, and one of the calls on the program said, you know, we don't really want Jesus to come. We're comfortable living on this earth. And, you know, what you're seeing now, these things have to happen. It's prophecy. It's prophecy being fulfilled. But the earth is groaning and humanity is getting impatient and fed up. So we tend to take matters into our own hands. But many people don't care enough to study prophecy or understand history until something unexpected happens and to them personally or in society at large. One of my hopes and prayers is that some of the lawyers that I meet uh, in the cases that I handle will take a step back and start asking themselves, why does religious liberty matter so much? The idea that anyone will want to force you or force me to think like them should send really a shiver down your spine. I can't make anyone think like me, and this is something that I say in many of the presentations that I make, I can't make anyone think like me. But then that's not my job. You know, I'm here to try to be a witness for the Lord, showing you that God's way is better and how you handle that information is up to you. And one of the reminders I wanna give everyone is from the last quarter. You remember last quarter's lesson on the great controversy by Mark Finley. And Mark Finley said, on, it was May 30th and June 9th, Mark Finley said the following, these committed followers of the Savior will not only have faith in Jesus, but will also have the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is a faith so deep, so trusting, so committed, that all the demons in hell and all the trials on earth cannot shake it. It is a faith that trusts when it cannot see, believes when it cannot reason why, and hopes when it cannot understand. And that is something that I think we need to remember because that's the type of faith that we're going to need to have. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for hearing and answering our prayers. And Lord, I just pray that you will be with us as we depart from this place, but not from your presence. I pray that the fellowship that we have afterwards will be uh, in line with you and also for us to remember that this is the Sabbath. Lord, thank you so much for hearing and answering our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.